Hello, this podcast is recorded on Gadigal country and we pay our respects to the First Nations custodians of the land, both here and also wherever you're listening from. Hi, why are you looking at me like that? I just thought you might like to start today. Okay. <laughs> well, now I feel like I've got to come up with some sort of incredible flourish. I can come up with an incredible Screw flourish. Screw you! <laughs> Deadpool and Wolverine, baby, I dragged you to it. Yeah. You've made yourself a powerful enemy. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I did submit to your blandishments and I accompanied you, it is true, to see Deadpool v Wolverine uh, at the Dendy in now, Newtown, along with a very, very, very small audience. Let's go through it blow by blow. Okay, so in the lead up to it, I actually started getting wobbly and I was thinking... I think this might be bad. And the things that gave me this feeling were... Um, Part 9 billion in the series of Lee Sales belatedly realises something that Annabelle Crabb has really known all along and then <laughs> explains it to Crabb. <laughs> so I was For worried. Sure. I was thinking, um, okay, firstly, I read one bad review. And so I thought... <laughs> just, oh. just the one? And, it was the, and the review was basically uh, that... It, it the first film was great, but the gags are tired. That that was the general gist of that the review. That was in the Guardian, though. Like I mean, it was it was in the Herald actually. Oh, was it? Yeah. Mm, okay. Then the second uh, thing was the sheer volume of promotional material that Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds were doing. I was like, but they actually started to make me think. Geez, this is an absolute stinker because these guys are bending over backwards every day. I'd log onto social media. Yeah. Now they're in Brazil. Now they're in Berlin. We got run over by a bus in London that was all Wolverine. It, and, yeah. There has been so much promotion of the film, and they have just been on every chat show. And so I felt like, wow, they're really bending over backwards here. So is that what they do when it's a stinker that they? Well, I don't know actually, but I just felt like, gee, for two A-listers, you guys are really hustling well, hard. Well, also, here. I mean, a lot rides on the commercial success of this film, right? Because the the franchise is not in a healthy place and i can report that it made something like half a billion dollars in its opening weekend so it, it's kind of you oh, know really so marvel's not going to die off <laughs> well deadpool's not at least or wolverine but uh and then the other thing was because there was so much social media content of hugh jackman and, and ryan reynolds and mostly they're pitching their kind of you know buddy right relationship. and those two were still Stapled together stapled in all of the together. publicity, weren't they? Stapled like, together. No one was even going to the toilet and leaving their buddy like uncovered. And I, is that because otherwise, if it was just Hugh Jackman doing it, that everyone would just ask him about his divorce? That's my assumption that Ryan mm. is there to just protect Hugh and to keep the tone light. So he's like a meat space blanket. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then so I had seen so much social media content of these two and they're kind of taking the mickey out of each other the whole time that I felt, let's be honest, I'm a little bit sick of the pair of them. Okay. So can you imagine how much fun that is for me, having been <laughs> absolutely shoehorned into showing up anyway? And I knew that she felt wonky about it when, on my way to the cinema, she texts me and she goes, I'm going to Tokyo Lamington. Do you want a Lamington? <laughs> And I'm like, then why are you buying me a lamington? You're having doubts, are just like, smoothing things out. And then it's like, but she went to a real effort as well, like texting me the whole menu <laughs> and which lamington would you like? I mean, this is not classic sales behaviour. Sometimes you get a lamington, nice. You don't normally get to choose the lamington. It's always <laughs> nice. You'll eat the goddamn lamington <laughs> right? I've picked for you. You'll force this yuzu lamington down your throat. And sure enough, sure enough. We get. I'm. I'm waiting in the empty foyer. Oh, there this is go, hilarious Gwen. as well. But yeah, yeah. I know it's hilarious. That's why I'm telling the freaking story, mate. Like, I mean, thank you for your. <laughs> no, there's a hilarious though. bit coming up. There is. Well, there goes that suspense. <laughs> <laughs> now, if it's not that funny. I feel like can, so, okay. you're kicking me in the nuts repeatedly. Okay. Finish, yeah. finish, go, finish going down the rabbit hole that you're in, and then we'll. No, I, I feel like then it's. I'm going to build another annex in this rabbit hole. I'm okay. having fun down here. To um, add to add a little bit of backstory, even taking it further back, the night before you and I had both independently gone to the Sydney Theatre Company to see Dracula, which is now over. It was fantastic. No point us talking about it because you can't go and see it. Yeah, so it was really, it, it, it was really it great. Come, if it well comes done. back, like. Do anything you can to see. Really it. fantastic. Um, so, <laughs> I still was suffering from jet lag almost two weeks on from getting home from London. Um, actually, let's just do another quick diversion while we're doing that. Gwen wants me to tell everybody that there are limited editions of those London tea towels available. Oh, yeah. They were only made for London, but she's had a few more made, mm -hmm. and they are available to buy on the website. 
I love the design. It's like the rip-off of the Abbey Road album cover. I loved it so much, in fact, that I'm getting one framed from my wall at home. Are you? Yes, in celebration is, of our 10 years of chat 10. Oh, that's yes. lovely. Anyway, Gwen said, tell people if you want one, get on the website, buy one, blah, blah, blah. Right. Also, while we're at it, um, it's not just that we only celebrated our 10-year anniversary in London. We're also doing it in um, on November the 1st at Hamer Hall. In Melbourne. It's just been announced and tickets have been released. There are some, like, Unbelievably exciting guests. I'm not sure. Great guests. No, we're we not haven't saying said it, yet, but, but like, I'm dying. But they're locked yeah. in and like. Yes. Yeah. Exciting. So um, I would move. Art Centre Melbourne quickly. for tickets for that. And yep. also Perth Show September the 15th, Perth Concert Hall or Ticketmaster. You can get the tickets for that. That's also going to be a super fun show. Love going to Perth. Yeah. So Perth people, Melbourne people, go buy tickets. Tea towel obsessives, go and buy a tea towel. <laughs> Back to Deadpool. Back to Deadpool. Okay, so, so the night before, we're at Dracula. Yeah. I've still got jet lag from the London trip. Do not, do not assume for. For a minute that we were there together, by the way. I was there with Jeremy. Loser was there by herself. Just a single <laughs> I, ticket, thanks. When Dracula got such good word of mouth when we were overseas, I was like, I'm going to miss out on this. It's going to be like Dorian Gray. So I just quickly jumped online and got one ticket on the first available night I was yep. free so I wouldn't miss out. Turns out Murph had tickets for the same night. Murph got sick, gave them to you and Jeremy, so we weren't sitting together, just sheer coincidence. I get there. The show starts... The woman who was the lead, Zara Newman was yeah. her name, she was just superb. Had, wow. Had one of those yep. beautiful, the exact opposite to the way I'm speaking now, one of those beautiful, calm, actorly voices that's very soothing. And within 10 minutes I was like, oh, no, I'm in such bad trouble here because of my jet lag. And it was one of those shows where I fell asleep and I would wake up leaning with my mouth open and I was so I was in such a deep sleep, like there'd be a loud noise on stage and it would kind of jerk me a bit awake and I'd think I must have been snoring. I was in such a deep sleep. The person next to me is going to elbow me in a second. Um, and then I'd kind of be like, for God's sake, wake up, wake up. And then I couldn't. And then I actually really only woke up at the end when people got up to give a standing ovation and I couldn't that even like, stand up because I was what? too tired. <laughs> Missed the whole thing. So this woman, like, I mean, it's an incredible <laughs> – she played 23 characters. She was so amazing. Yeah. Dracula, Van Helsing, Lucy, everybody. And the quality of her voice, I mean, you've undercooked it a bit just saying she's got a lovely sort oh, of she was extraordinary. Like, bass sort of voice. I mean, she inhabited and occupied every single character fully. Like there wasn't anybody that was half cooked as a character, even the minor ones. And her vocal range was like unbelievable. And I felt really dumb as well because I'm like, I didn't recognize, I'm like, who's this chick? And then I looked her up, I'm like, far out. Like, Now, so when I say she was extraordinary, I mean for the – sort of cumulative seven minutes or so that I was awake. Yeah, I mean, At one point I saw a woman who was dressed as Dracula and then a while later I opened my eyes and it appeared to be the same person but they were now like a kind of an old man. So are and you for real you didn't realise until we briefed you after the no, show I that did. that was all just I, one woman? I knew because I'd read up on it. But um, but anyway, and also can I just – firstly, let me apologise to the people who are wanting to just know, for God's sake, Deadpool and Wolverine, was it any good? We're getting to it and I'd we thank are. you to be patient. But I've got a few more – yeah, we're getting so we're taking our time. Wings to explore. But my friend Mark Humphreys, when I told him about the theatre thing, which he for some inexplicable Everybody reason Everybody knows friends with Mark Humphreys. <laughs> Stop doing that. He found it extremely amusing and he said that I should expect to see myself in the paper written up under the headline, Australian Snorry. And he <laughs> thought that it added a particular frisson to the yarn that it turned out you were at the theatre on the same t- night but we weren't actually seated right. together. That is not surprising. But, like, the other thing, I mean, surely if you're listening to this podcast – and you have a friend who's friends with a friend who was sitting next to Lee Sales who was <laughs> snoring like an absolute, what, what, you know. Please get in touch on 1-800-Humiliate-Sales. <laughs> do. I mean, I would enjoy that. And I think I'd like, I mean, I suspect and you suspect that you were snoring like a grampus, but I think I would really like to hear from anybody with direct evidence. It really about. added a lot to the fact nice, that though. I like was You put in a bit alone. of effort. You look, looked nice. Do you know what? I know I had a conversation with you and Jeremy at the end, but I was so tired. I feel like I could hardly make sense. And you were saying stuff and I was like, but uh, uh, it was one of those. I was so tired. Yeah. That's anyway, when we so, told you we were getting a divorce, but like so, you obviously remember. <laughs> so next day on the way to Deadpool and Wolverine, I'm like, okay, I just had a bad experience in a darkened location falling asleep. I think that there's a possibility this may happen again today and so I'm just going to pre-warn crap about that. Hence, I've bought the Lamington and I've texted you and said I may not last out the whole film. So, so then. Yeah. 
lots of good news coming in from Lee Sales, like having succeeded in maybe going, making me go to see this thing. She's like, Captain Chuckles, so I we, hate this. I think it's going to be terrible. I may fall asleep. So we, we, let's leave early if it's awful. So we, I get there. You're seated alone or I see you in the distance seated alone and I'm wearing gym gear, a baseball cap and sunglasses. Oh, I'm you look walking, like a robber's dog. I'm yeah. walking right towards you. You look at me and you look away. You did not did recognise not me. That. You did yeah. not recognise me. And then I'm basically upon you and I go, it's me. And then yeah. you're like, oh, right, okay, great. It's so funny. Like there's literally no one else in this theatre and or in cinema and the person I'm expecting walks towards me surrounded by no people whatsoever and I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how, I mean, under the radar sales is very tricky to spot. I mean, she's still a six foot <laughs> ranger, but with the hat and the glasses and the, frankly, let's describe it as tired active wear, shall we? Like, Somebody. She's got a special line in an active wear that's like 100 years old and it's all bally and kind of. That is so true. I, I hate true. spending money on active yeah. wear. I don't like Got a glimpse of your bra too. It's like grey as the winter sky. <laughs> it's true. Lucky I didn't get a look at your undies. They can't have been any better, can they? <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> oh, God. Again, I apologise to the listeners who are just wanting just... a clean take on Deadpool and Wolverine. <laughs> it's coming. Anyway, so we get to the front of the counter. <laughs> oh, you've taken <laughs> this story over, have you? All right. Well, I tend to find your interjections very entertaining, so I feel like if I take the lead and you interject, that could mm-hmm. work. So... We get to the front counter, you're babbling away to the dude, oh, could I please have two tickets to Deadpool? Blah, 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 blah. And then he just randomly goes, um, Ms. Sales, you're a fan of the Marvel Universe? And, oh, just, she's like, not engaged, she's looking the other way, I'm being as nice as pie, he's got no idea who I am, but he's clocked her, like, no problem. I, I was kind of speechless and went, uh, well, I mean, I'm a fan of Deadpool, and then we kind of walked away, and you go, did you just get Ms. Sales? <laughs> and I went, yeah. Ms. Sales. And I was like, you didn't even recognise me and that like 17-year-old clocked that it was me. Yeah. It was really quite strange. So then we go into the theatre. That's the youth demographic of Australian story right there, that guy. <laughs> I would suggest his parents or grandparents are probably the demographic of it and he just no, gets... No, he seemed very switched on. Do you think? Anyway. I thought maybe he just gets shit. accidental exposure to me. Doesn't explain how he still clocked <laughs> it was me all, under <laughs> all of that. <laughs> Should have flashed him your bra strap. <laughs> <laughs> Some men find aged, elastic, going grey bra straps very attractive, I'll have you know. I'll take your word for it. So we go into the theatre. It's me and you. It's two dudes behind us, Mm -hmm. one single dude in front of us, one single other woman, and then two dudes over on the far side. That's the sum total of people in the theatre. Can confirm. We eat our Lamingtons. The show starts. Yep. It was great. I loved it. (laughs) Is that it? (laughs) So... I would describe my journey as a little bit more detailed than yours in the sense that I – look, I just don't watch Marvel movies. No, um, I don't really I, can, I find them impossible to follow. I've seen a couple of them with my children and I always just zone out because I'm like, I'm sorry, which which – multiverse are we in now have and you it just seen seems... any wolverine i've seen no wolverine i've seen no wolverine okay. um, i don't think so no, unless i either. fell asleep which has happened um i don't know it just seems to me like there's just an almost flagrant inattention to plot like it's just sort of the bits of plot that they are that there are i mean this is just of the ones that i've seen seem to do nothing but get you from fight to fight so yeah. the fight thing is the big thing? Like yeah. The, you know, and all the fights seem the same. I don't know. I sort of end up getting to the end of the, you know, four hours or however long they take and just think, so what? So it, it was a bit – that this film was a bit like that except the bits connecting the fight. I mean, the fights are really well done and for me they didn't go on too long. They weren't like 25 minutes at a stretch. Nobody fought on a train though. That's <laughs> that, original. There was a great sequence in a bus though with a dolly going alongside where there's a, a fight happening on a bus and there was a great fight between Deadpool and Wolverine confined in a, in a car. Yeah, in um, a, like a Honda Civic or something. It was, like, that was that funny. That was very funny. But they – the bits, the connective tissue between the fights, um, it's it's like the other Deadpools. If you like the other Deadpools, you'll like it. It's witty, it's smart, well, it's fast talking. I didn't mind the Deadpools because two reasons. One, there was at least a plot. Like, yeah. And, and the fights were, I thought, different from the usual Marvel fights in that they're just sort of 
comedically brutal like it's just, just video game it's, violence it's over well, the top it it's exaggerated and I mean, i'm not a huge fan of that or video game violence or really you know violence in movies massively i'm not I'm one of these people who's like ooh, that blood spatter doesn't look quite right but i did think it was sort of making a bit of a point in um and the deadpool movies that i've seen to date um you know it's so over the top and then there's just this pushing it too far humour as well where you're kind of yeah. laughing but you've got your hand <laughs> over your mouth yeah. and you're like, did he really just say that? Yeah. And that is the bit that I enjoyed. Same. And I enjoyed that very much in this film. But because my expectations were so low, like I'm talking the belly of an overweight <laughs> sausage dog low, um, I, was my, I was just like, well, you know, yeah. this is going to be terrible. Even the people who like this stuff, some of them have said this is terrible, so I'm yeah. standing by for this to be terrible. And as a result, quite enjoyed it. And funnily enough, that one bad review I read yesterday, I was reading, I can't remember, sorry if it was the Washington Post or the New York Times, um, <clears throat> and they had best movies so far of 2024 and Deadpool and Wolverine was on mm-hmm. there and got it, had a really good write-up. So um, just goes to show, make your own mind up, don't always be swayed by reviews. But um, one of the things that I really also enjoyed about it other than, you know, I, I like the character of Deadpool. I find him funny. I like the sort of yep. smart assery and the shtick. Um, it was observing in the theatre what you and I reacted to versus what other people in oh, the theatre reacted to. <clears throat> so you and I were laughing at all of the kind of breaking of the fourth wall stuff and the references to things outside the film universe. So there's a scene where Hugh Jackman takes his shirt off and Ryan Reynolds goes, oh, he's really let himself go since the divorce. That or was funny. There was a few bits where, I, I won't ruin the gag, but there was a thing that you and I both barked like seals at where Ryan Reynolds says this just hugely offensive line and then winks down the barrel of the camera. And oh, we God. were just screaming. That's right, because he's, 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 he's sort of failed and sad and he's in his apartment with his friends and his, you know, he and his hot girlfriend have split up and he's now got a job in a car yard. He's not Deadpool anymore. He's stapled a wig to his head. Like, <laughs> it's all pretty sad. And then there's a knock on the door and it's these time-travelling, you know, multiverse cops and they've got these sort of truncheons and he goes, so you're the strippers, right? Yep. And, and like... <laughs> it goes from there. <laughs> <laughs> and it just gets more when you think it can't filthy, get more offensive yeah. it just gets filthier 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 yeah. and then it peaks at just peak filthiness yeah and um ryan reynolds winks down the barrel of the camera and you and i were just yeah. laughing like drain because he goes like he's he's basically um, am i going to get fisted with this oh, you know? and he's, he's like oh <laughs> you know the- look I don't think Disney's, you know, I'm up for fisting. I don't know if Disney is. It's, well, like, it was just, since you've it ruined wasn't it, fisting. the actual line is. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. The actual line was, um, you know, I'm completely, pegging's not a first for me, okay. but it is for Disney. <laughs> and then he winks and down the camera. It's the most perfect piece of comic timing. And it's also like there is something, because all this stuff is so f- fake and like the Marvel universe is something of which I faintly disapprove because I feel like it's just steamrolling every other form of cinema. But probably takes somebody of Ryan Reynolds sort of like sense of irreverence to actually make money out of teasing his own like yeah. company but, in the movie. But then I think the other thing and why perhaps the fans roll with it is apparently it is just studded like a fruitcake with um, references to things that if you're a fan of that stuff that you... Well, like Avengers, for instance. Yeah. I've never seen any Avengers Same movies. Here. But so like, all of that stuff, all of those clever references that were there for the fans went over mind your head, mm. but they were landing oh with God. a couple of the other people in the room. So there was a guy behind us. There was this kind of weird bit that neither you nor I got where... There was a gu- dude who was walking on with a cloak over his head so he couldn't see his face and they were just building up and building up this reveal and uh, to the degree that I'm thinking, like, what, is it going to be Brad Pitt or somebody? Like, is it Chris Hemsworth? Like, it's such a huge reveal. And then the dude flings back the cape. You and I don't react at all. Nope. And then he goes shooting into the air into a, a big column of flame yep. and the guy behind us actually audibly Lost went, yep. oh! And just It was so good. And I leant over to you and went... Do you know who that was? No, and then I'm like, I'm going through the cut. Is it that guy? I don't know. I mean, the we moment just, was... We were baffled. Completely lost on us. Absolutely. And there was a couple of other moments like that where there was big reactions from the two groups of blokes in oh, the yeah. room and you and I just... 
utterly blanked it. It was like sort of watching an orcs documentary with Dungeons and Dragons players where <laughs> like, you know, oh, an orc would totally not do that. And then you're like, would they? I don't know. Never really. That's right. Whereas I'm doing things like, oh, in the scene with all the Deadpools, that guy had a Wrexham logo on his thing. Oh, it was Paul Mullum from, Re-, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, but look, overall, my, my gauge for when I go and see something at the theatre is because you can just watch so much stuff at home on your TV now, I was like, I always feel like, was that $25 well spent? And I feel like, yeah, I got my $25 worth. Yeah, but you also worth. picked up the tab for the Lamingtons. $30 well spent. Also, I paid for the tickets. $5 well spent. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Also, I'll also say that it is a long movie. It Fair? was a long movie. That was the other movie. thing going into it. I was thinking yeah. mm, it was two hours and yeah. eight minutes. And so at about the sort of hour and 20 point you leaned over and you went this is still got another hour to go I'm like thank you yes <laughs> can add up and then the baseball cap went on in the cinema she's popped the baseball cap back on and then she's sort of reclined a little bit I'm like you asshole you're gonna sleep through this bit but now. I didn't I stayed that's because I kept jabbing it <laughs> I kept Stay jumping awake in. for the whole thing I took the cap off at one point because warm head makes you sleepy I think do you? You don't. Literally, I've never thought about it. Wow. Okay. I've got a lot of hair though, so I never have a cold head. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then I put it on cause, because I was feeling a bit chilly, so I thought I need to warm my head up. You know, you do, you surely you know most of your body heat escapes through your head. Again, not yeah, a problem for you. Exactly. I just, <laughs> um, I'm always a bit overheated. Um, one thing, so I, I think the strengths of the film, just to conclude our critical remarks, uh, scripting and kind of just – sass like there's just yeah. an extra bit that it's not cheesy you're just like oh geez did you just say that like it's quite edgy yeah in bits um it's obviously very bloody um Hugh Jackman is terrific like I don't know the Wolverine character but he's like genuinely just a, a sort of like an asshole and like and, I, and I'm told that that is sort of you know a kind of an exploration of that character. Like people have, have said, oh, look, he still finds more in that character. He was great. Is that his actual Oh, uh, my body? question is actually, exactly. I, He's gigantic. So nobody is built like that, right? I mean, the six-pack is extraordinary. And his arms are like absolutely yeah. gigantic. They and can't and be I retouching though because that would be too hard, wouldn't would it? Would it be CGI or something? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Do they like, it, you know... Is it Hugh Jackman's head on an animated body? I, I don't know. Let us know. I mean, Hugh Jackman's intel. obviously in good shape, yeah. um, but he just looked so gigantic. Yeah, it's ridiculous, actually. Yeah. yeah. So I was curious about that. And, and, you know, Ryan Reynolds is certainly about half his size. Right. So anyway. Ryan I mean, Reynolds is tall, but yeah. not, like, super buff. Well, he's yes. buff, but he's... Here we go. Like, I think we've said enough <laughs> things about this. <laughs> just, okay? Okay. By the way... Liked the film, liked it a lot. Enjoyed um, it. Yeah, yes, it was did. Good. It's sort of like, it's not shot very well. Like, it's a weird kind of like, like it's, it's not cinema. shot very well. Well, it's, the lighting seems a bit like sort of flat or something. I don't know. Like, in I this, mean, it, I mean, it, it, Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, I don't are know, we still talking? It feels a bit like, I can't, I can't, actually, I don't have the language to explain what I mean. I don't, oh. I don't mean like, obviously, the action, you know, it's all, it seems like all the energy's gone into that rather than to, I don't know. I felt like the lighting was a bit okay. Stop saying things. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I, look, I I didn't notice that. I mean, I did think that they it looked it seemed like a big budget film. Like totally, a yes. lot of money yeah. had been spent yeah. on um, the look of it. Yeah. And also, I, I mean, what city was that set in? Or was it just meant to be like generic Marvel universe oh, American city? I don't know. I couldn't tell. I it had yellow mm, cabs, so they thought it was New York. But then they showed other scenes. I was like, that's not New York. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. All the Marvel um, fans are listening to this because there's just, a massive crossover between Chat Ten fans and Marvel universe. The massive, yeah. Um, and it's they're like just that going, time where I got the characters the wrong way around, like Ryan Reynolds and John, um, what's his face in? Oh yeah. <laughs> John Krasinski. Krasinski. Yeah, yeah, I got them mixed up, guys. <laughs> and uh, people wrote in, oh, I heard from some people. Speaking of superheroes, uh, yep. the kids and I have abandoned our evening television viewing habits in favour of watching the Olympics, oh, yep. which has been great. Yeah, very um, cool. They are addicted to watching the skateboarding mm-hmm. and the BMX bike riding, yep. both of which I am I marvel at, but I find very difficult to watch because of the brutality of the falls. Yep. And then I <clears> discovered <throat> when I said to my kids, oh, guys, oh, oh that was just so bad. They're, they're watching for the falls. They want those. They bits, want the yeah. falls, those little psychopaths. They want somebody to lose their teeth. They love yeah. a fall. They love watching a fall. I 
um, watched the opening ceremony on delay and I was absolutely fascinated by it because I love an opening ceremony. I kind of I quite like watching all the teams arrive and they did it in a really different way this time from past. You know how normally it's all just set in some giant arena so you've got crowds, you've got um, athletes arriving, in the middle you've got, you know, formation dancing or the queen arriving by parachute or yeah. like, you know, um, all the stuff that we did in Sydney. But this time they decided to set it sort of all in the city. And so the athletes arrived on boats along the Seine and then there were these sort of performances along the banks of the Seine, which I kind of understand that they've got a beautiful city and they're like including the city. And also because it's largely a telecast event, they're like, okay, well, we'll have, you know, this frankly quite baffling range of <laughs> superstars performing like, hello, Lady Gaga. No idea that you were French. Um, Celine Dion, French-ish. I mean, definitely closer than Gaga. Um, <laughs> Did they introduce Lady Gaga by calling her Mademoiselle Gaga? She was not introduced. She just <laughs> oh. emerged from behind these big oh. feathery fans. Oh. But the weird thing, I actually found it underwhelming because I think I like to feel like I'm witnessing a giant human scale event. And I was, it just wasn't apparent in the broadcast. So yeah. I felt like it felt a bit um, anticlimactic. Like, so the bit with Celine De- Dion, which I assume she must have hunted down and murdered some of the people behind this production by now because it was pissing down with rain. And so all of these stars that are performing in little sort of sets of steps and niches along the banks of the Seine, you know, poor old Celine was there with a uh, grand piano oh. and a sort of what looked like about $50,000 worth of hair and makeup. But it was pissing down. So, like, oh. there was droplets on the camera. Oh. The lighting was like – it's like they just shone a dolphin torch on her. <laughs> and the <laughs> piano was wet. Oh. Everything that was – Rishi Sunak vibes. <laughs> a thousand percent. I'm like, get – a tarpaulin <laughs> over this lady and also <laughs> stop shooting up at her. Like whoever was oh, on the cameras no. was like... Oh, I hate that. Now angle. the rule is if if a person is over, I'd say, 35 years of age, don't fucking shoot up at them. You like, know, and you know, just and nice, Give them some nice lighting. lighting. Yeah. No, yeah. it was just like I actually watched it just going, oh, God. Oh, oh, but anyway, I mean, yeah. maybe she liked it. I don't know. See, I'll say... And it was also I, a bit like, oh, it's all, it just feels a bit like... Somebody performing in someone's backyard. I didn't see any of the opening ceremony, but I kind of also, this could be an Australian thing, but I like, and possibly a bit of childhood conditioning, I like a bit of kitsch, but that but that might just be me because I grew up in Brisbane in the Commonwealth Games. Ollie, Willie and Molly or whatever. Winky, yeah. big kangaroo, the Sydney Olympics, the kangaroos on the bicycles. I like that kind of, mm-hmm. I want to see some. Because you are essentially be, a gay man. I want it to be a bit Eurovision-y. I yeah. want it to be a bit, you know, kitschy. Yeah. Um, really. So, yeah, that, that sounds like I probably wouldn't have enjoyed that either. I don't know. I just felt a bit, like, itchy about it. Um, okay, so... Uh, there was the, the, the balloon torch was pretty great, though. I so, didn't see any of that. So the torch, you know, there's always like, ooh, what yeah. are they going to do with the torch? So the torch is this beautiful golden balloon, which is um, how they used to communicate during the siege of Paris in 1871. I know this because I've recently read a book that I'll tell you about one day. Um they used to um, use balloons to get information in and out because the Prussian army was encircling Paris. And so the balloon is like this sort of symbol. Oh. And the basket of the balloon has like was the thing that was lit. Oh, yeah. And so it's like a donut of fire and then the balloon kind of wow. took off and apparently is going to be hovering over the city for the whole games, which is a gorgeous idea. Wow, that is so a like very that. good idea. Yeah. Um, okay, so a couple of things I've... Every time someone kind of lands in my consciousness, I sort of go on a Google rabbit hole. So, of course, the latest one's Simone Biles, the American gymnast. Right. Have oh, you watched that Netflix my series? goodness me. No. I Is started... there a Netflix series? Mate. Okay, this time next <laughs> fortnight, you're going to be back here. <laughs> Giving you an e-bashing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great because she's this incredible character, right? Like she's... Even her Wikipedia, I was like, wow, yeah. what a backstory. Yeah. Like fo- fostered out and then the grandparents discovered she been fostered out and they go and get her and like just amazing. Yeah, and yeah. then she's one of the gymnasts that put Larry Nasser in yes. prison for 100 million it years or whatever. It was really extraordinary. So like built of 
strong stuff. And you she got a dose she, of the twisties in yeah, there. In, yeah, in Tokyo. And she was already yeah. the most famous athlete in the world. And she did a um, vault dismount or something and she was supposed to do two and a half twists and she only did one and a half and people were like, what's going on? And she's like got this condition called the twisties where you lose your ability as a gymnast to kind of find your coordinates no, you in, space. in space. And yeah. you just – and so she dropped out. And this this series on Netflix is her reflections – on that. Oh, great. Um, okay. And yeah. Oh, all right. I've, I've only just started that. watching it. But um, I was reading a thing <clears throat> yesterday talking about how when athletes come along who are really super inspirational and become super famous like her, how it has just a, an outsized um, impact on the sport. And they were talking yeah. about um, how it creates depth of talent because then you get all these flood of new people. And so they were saying like, so say in the Eastern Bloc after – you know, Nadia Comaneci was famous, but then no one came up behind her. Then mm. she became too old to inspire younger women because they didn't know who she was. And then they kind of lost all their depth. And so that's why right. they slipped away. It was really it's amazing really how one person can be such a like, powerful influence on that. I, yeah. One of the um, moments in the Olympics that just really almost moved me to tears was the post bout interview that Harry Garside gave, the Australian oh, yeah. boxer. Like, so he was, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, like, go. He won bronze and is like the first Australian, I think, no, I don't know, my boxing history is uncharacteristically threadbare here, but he was hoping to win a medal and he got a bye in the first round. I don't know this because I watched the boxing at the Olympics. I don't. I just by chance saw this thing that happened after he was eliminated in his first fight that went for nine minutes, got his ass kicked by some Hungarian that was, you know, not fancied to win the bout. And you know how they make them go and do the post-match interview? He kind of struggled through it a little bit and he was like, he was just, I'm, I, I feel so terrible and so guilty. I've let everybody down. I know how, you know, Australians are all watching the Olympics and <sighs> I feel like I have totally screwed this up. And then he said, I feel like numb. Um, I'm really dreading the next few months because this. I, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. And then he just fell to the floor and and was sobbing, right? Oh. Just physically couldn't accommodate all these feelings in his body. And this guy's just been punched in the face for nine minutes and, you know. And I thought his, his mortification was so evident oh. and he wasn't like the other guy had been like taunting him and was a bit of a dick, but he wasn't carrying on about that or like poor me or, you know, the umpire's got it wrong or whatever. He was just... I've let everybody down. I feel the worst I've ever felt. What and did the person? Do, how did the person doing the interview handle it? Well, the interviewer was good, like, and kept saying, "You haven't let us down," like, you know. But I mean, it's almost like he was in his own yeah, space. Right. And then, and and they kind of cut away, but like, he he couldn't, you know, even stand. Oh, and so, poor dude. and I thought, you know what? Like, I can't imagine that poor guy's going to be reliving that nine minutes for a long time but I also look at Simone Biles who in the documentary talks about how she felt in Tokyo and it kind of sounds a little bit the same and that's why I think like she's a really powerful example of how you can get to just the lowest point and then you know and I I thought actually what Garci did I'm sure it wasn't you know deliberate but I thought that that's a really valuable thing for kids to see um because he was talking about how he got into sport and boxing because he'd watched Grant Hackett and found him so kind of inspirational. And obviously Grant Hackett has like had some, you know, really tough times after leaving sport as well. And I think even though we're really good in Australia at, you know, gold rush and, you know, super enthusiasm, we're not that great at preparing people for failure oh, yeah. and, or understanding, you know, just what that feels like. But after watching him, I'm like, it's, I know what that I could feel what he was feeling like and I think maybe it's a bit of a gift to show kids that you can be a really tough person and be like he's obviously made of titanium mm. and when something happens that hurts you you cry and you you know and you feel. take responsibility and you're kind of like 
you let yourself feel all those feelings rather than pretending that it's all all right and then yeah. going home and kicking the dog or whatever. So yeah. anyway, so good on your Harry Gar side, I think. So this reminds me uh, of a podcast that I just listened to called Death, Sex and Money. My friend Sylvie had recommended it to me and I finally listened to an episode and it happened to be with the American um, gold medalist diver Greg Leganis. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, now, do you remember Greg Leganis when he hit his head on the diving Yes, board? I do. My God, I, I can still hear that same thud, and, and I can it. still remember how I felt when I saw that interestingly the interviewer talked to him about that and he said he said so many people still talk about that and she said why do you think it's so burned in people's mind because really that's that was very memorable in my mind long before the revelation came out in the mid 90s it right, came out God. that Greg Leganis was HIV positive that's and right. had competed in that Olympics that's HIV right. positive and in that era there was all these questions about well did, did blood get in the pool and did you tell the doctor who stitched God, you yeah. up at the games <clears throat> about da, 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 da. anyway um but the dive even before all of that the dive is really seared in my head as this kind of like sickening moment and, and Greg Leganis says he thinks that people had such a visceral reaction to it because it was so kind of horrifying to observe someone hit their head at that height on a diving board and then just to watch people especially someone at that level who's so Mm. graceful then just kind of collapse into the pool Mm. um that it just really stuck in people's heads as a very super memorable moment in sport but he um he talked about having won a silver medal at the games before he won two gold medals and he was saying um it he said when you look at the photo of me on the podium my head's down he said i felt like the world's biggest failure he said the silver me- no one's more upset ever than the silver medalist because i don't come know so close i think the person who came forth is probably a bit yeah, more you'd be and there's that there's that great tracy moffat series called coming forth so it's just called forth actually right. she's a um just amazing australian photographer um and in the sydney games she sat and watched it on television with her camera and off the live broadcast, not the news packages because they never show the person who came forth, she was just there poised waiting wow. to snap the television brief footage oh. of the person who didn't get a medal. And it's the most its the most incredible series. I mean, it's amazing to think that you could shoot an image off the TV oh, <laughs> and make an amazing... That sounds incredible. Yeah, I think they've got a what bunch a of them. Idea. I think they've got most... I think they've got a few of them at the MCA in Sydney. Ugh. But, like, you can see them, I think if you go to the Roslyn Oxley 9 gallery webpage, you can look, because I went and looked, actually, the other day, and it's just... Oh, that sounds amazing. It's I must really, have a look at that. yeah, just these people's faces with the graininess of the television. But I think it also tells you the things that we don't witness or don't count like so all of those you know oh what happened to the person who came forth never in the evening news package because it's all about the gold or whatever and so there's something I read a comment that she had made about that series where she said I wanted to say something about the magnificence of trying (laughs) it's just a lovely that's so good um well Greg Leganis it was a really really interesting interview about just his personality type and kind of his family upbringing and what drove him to achieve so much in diving and, mm. and so on. So if you're kind of interested in, as you know, I love sports psychology, so I was very interested in it. Um, so I recommend that. The other thing that I'd recommend, which is both funny and educational, Andy Lee on his Instagram has got this series on during the Olympics called Comparison Man, where what? he runs footage oh, yeah. of a famous moment in sport and he attempts to do the <laughs> same thing and sees how it goes. Right. So firstly, it's just hilarious so there was one where um they've got somebody does a dive off the 10 meter board and it's like absolutely flawless with a triple pike blah 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 and then into the water with next to no splash and then Andy gets out there he ends up dangling from his fingers from the board because he's trying to not have to fall so far and then he falls in the thing that's so hilarious is the size of the wedgie that he gets from landing in the pool on his bum it's really amusing but they they cut between Andy and the other person really doing it to show oh, at this point in the dive. That's a great idea. Yeah, so one of the things I never knew with diving, when the person actually gets into the water, they do a thing with their body to minimise the kind of secondary splash yeah. that comes up. So, so they can get a bubble entry. Yeah, so they want all these tiny bubbles to come in tight so it doesn't get a big splash. And so they have an underwater camera where you see that person's and then you see Andy's. And it was just really educational. And then they do one with Sally Pitt and where she's hurdling and um, and then Andy's hurdling as well. Um, they break it right down to like, so she gets out of the blocks and she's in like 0.1 of a second and he's in 0.6 of a second or something and then he's clearing the hurdles with like, you know, 
50 centimetres or something and she's clearing them because she's not wasting any energy. She's clearing them with about three millimetres or something. Anyway, it's really – it makes you think about sport and things in a way that you haven't before and it's really hilarious. So what's the production values like? Is this a shot on someone's phone? Really good. No, they've they've clearly spent some – It's going to say this sounds like a really good drunk late night idea that he's now doing. No, it it probably did start as a really great drunk idea but they've actually put some resources into it so – Oh, it's I will really absolutely funny. go and look that up. That's that's right, my alley. Um, we wasted so much we time have. on Deadpool that uh, we're at an end. I've got one more thing to say because it sort of fits in with your Greg Laganus thing and the fact that we both remember so um, viscerally that particular moment and I haven't thought about it for years. Um, I've been watching this new um, series that's on ABC iView. It's from the makers of You Can't Ask That and oh, it's yeah. called I Was Actually There. Oh, and yeah. I'm kind of watching it. It's amazing and I also am a bit like, God, I wish I'd thought of this. Like it's such a good idea. Yeah. And it's going back and um, revisiting a moment that we all remember if we're of a certain age or whatever um, and just interviewing people who were really there. Sometimes happy ones, sometimes sad ones. Well, the first one is Port Arthur, which is like a – God, it's a a really – chunky one to lead with um there's also you know the barley bombings and i don't think it's all kind of disasters but um it's but the it's, beatles in it's, 1964 right yeah it's actually done so beautifully like when i started watching it i thought oh how's this going to go because you know i mean in tasmania there's a real kind of yeah there's you've got to approach it really carefully they don't like using the name of the person who is responsible. There's a lot of just like, would you please get out of our faces, which I completely understand um, because it's not a huge community and, my God, they sustained something so dreadful. Um, and also you get that thing when there's so many people who have been killed and so many stories of just horror, then that's what gets concentrated on at the time and it's like numbers death count kind of thing and the the thing about this particular um episode is that it goes to the people who were sort of there but probably weren't massively on the news at the time like there's just you know I was at the cafe and this is what I saw so you do get a sense of this sort of spreading set of consequences that have kind of pursued people through their lives and also the things that they still remember all these years Mm. later. Like there was a woman who had been a little girl at the time and she was in the cafe and she ran with her dad and her sister and they were hiding under a jetty. And she said, I just looked over at my dad. She said, I was watching my dad's feet and I was trying to imitate what he was doing with his feet so that I could run because I couldn't think for myself. And she also said when we were huddling there, she said, I looked at my dad's hand and all of the hairs were standing up. Like it's just sort of those, yeah. And so they've interviewed people, the choices of interviewees are great and also the things that like it's the edit is respectful and it is somehow, yeah, it's, it's quite a moving account of how humans respond when unthinkable things happen. Somebody told me as well that there's a companion podcast, which is also really incredible, yeah. which I haven't listened to. I only heard this yesterday when I heard it being interviewed on, yeah. uh, being advertised. So yeah. and, it, and the podcast, it's one of the people who's in the show, but their story in bigger oh. depth. And so the person, I'm told, so it could be wrong, but I'm told that the Port Arthur one is the sniper who was yeah, one he's, of the snipers who was, yeah, he's, pointing into the po- he's amazing. Port Cafe. Yeah, he's got this story about how, because he was from, I think, Victoria and... Um, was it? It's not, yeah, one of the cops anyway was from Victoria and they had to fly to Tasmania and they were like, what's going on? Nobody knew what was happening. It just knew that it was terrible. And when they all landed, they had no kind of jurisdiction in Tasmania. So they had to be sworn in as Tasmanian mm. police officers, but no goodness. one could find a Bible. And it was just like, anyway. Oh, goodness me. Um, sorry, I feel like we've ended on a Well, to end on a happy note, yeah. some people who awful things happened to made good things come out of that. One of them being my dear friend, Walter Mikak, who right. set up the Alana and Madeline Foundation. So if you've got some spare coin, why don't you flick it to that now yeah. that we've talked about this? And um, I found your interview of Walter in your book Any Ordinary Day, one of the most moving parts. And I think um, his account of his loneliness after having sustained probably the most memorable kind of and shocking bereavement of anybody, his account of how people struggled to deal with him after that was um, 
I think about it all the time. But I think, um, not to blow sunshine up your mangy ass, but like I think that your book does a good job of showing people how to respond to people to whom terrible things have happened. And that's it. It's been – thank you for the lamingtons. No problem. Thank lamingtons. you for the good chat. Thank you for the good debrief. Yeah. Thank you for enjoying both the oral and the visual experience of me talking to this lady here. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for so much more content. It'll probably quell your enthusiasm, but give us a go or listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you ever think that we'd be telling people to subscribe to our content? No, I did not. We're cool at last. Don't. You're <laughs> making me look bad in front of my children again.